Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Stephen, for giving us a free 10-day conference. There's not a lot of those anywhere. Thank you so much. I say there's not a lot of those. If I count all of the free 10-day conferences, they're all yours. <laughs> Every year, year after year. What a gift. Thank you. I have a question. I'd like you to, to do a self-evaluation here. I want you to give yourself a percentage number of what percentage of your diet is organic. That's at home, going out to eat, going to a friend's house, going to a ball game. What percentage would you guess? Now, don't be shy. This is a pretest. We're going to ask you what you plan to do with your diet after the talk, but let's see how many people are would say from 0% to 20%, raise your hand. Okay, good number. 20 to 40, almost the same, 40 to 60, a little bit less, 60 to 80, even less, 80 to 100. Okay, about the same as 60 to 80. And how many people now, how, how would you rate yourself in terms of your level of engagement in talking about organic, GMOs, Roundup, one or all of the three? How many people are not as much engaged in talking about it to others? Zero to 20, raise your hand. 20 to 40? 40 to 60? 60 to 80? 80 to 100? So evenly spread, a little bit of bulge at the 80 to 100, those of us who work that in this field and those of us and a little bulge at the, at the lower end. So I am going to talk about what we need to do to heal from GMOs and Roundup. And for years, the main thing that I would say was avoid them. Just avoid them. And in fact, in the film Secret Ingredients, we look at more than a dozen individuals who switched to organic food and got better from serious diseases or disorders. Two families had autistic sons. They switched to organic food. The sons are no longer diagnosed on the spectrum. At a chiropractor's office, her clinic, where she puts patients on an organic diet as part of her regimen, she's had 92 infertile couples now with children. 100% success rate among the infertile couples that have done her protocol. And that's in the film. We have people recovering from cancer, skin conditions, brain fog, allergies, bloating, all sorts of things. Now, this, these were not surprises to me because I think I have heard more of these type of recovery stories than perhaps anyone in the world. In fact, I would ask audiences at over 150 lectures, tell me what you've noticed when you switch to a non-GMO or organic diet. And someone raised their hand and say, okay, I, my acid reflux is better, or my irritable bowel, it's okay, how many others notice an improvement in digestion? And a lot of hands would go up, because digestion was always the number one. The number two was always reduced fatigue and brain fog. And then there was weight loss and pain loss and anxiety and depression. At one point, a woman yelled from the background, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> so I immediately said, okay, raise your hand if you've had erectile dysfunction. <laughs> so I was very competent, confident and competent based on the information that was given to me, both by individuals and by so many doctors, because I've talked to medical conferences where so many doctors reported these same benefits on behalf of their patients. And I've surveyed 3,256 people who showed us the same thing. I was very confident that getting rid of GMOs and Roundup in the diet would take care of a lot of problems. But people would always ask me, in addition to that, what can I do? And I would always say the same thing. It's above my pay grade. I'm not a healthcare professional, I'm not a scientist. Talk to them about what else you can do. I'm the guy that says eat organic and non-GMO. 
But then some doctors started telling me what they were doing to help their patients detox, rebuild, and repair. And I realized I have to share this. But I, I'm not sharing it as the spokesperson who's done the research. I'm not qualified. I'm very qualified, overqualified to ask the questions because I understand the ways that GMOs and Roundup hurt us. So last summer, we convened an online conference called Healing from GMOs and Roundup. You can access it at healingfromgmos.com. And we had 20, 18 different experts answer the question, how to heal from GMOs. And I know that there's some people that have to leave early. There's a group leaving at three. So I wrote down on this slide, there is going to be a discount for those watching it. It's on this slide. If you want to take a picture of it, there's a website. The promo code is TRUTH for the real truth about health. But we'll get to that at the end in case there's any interest in taking a look at this conference. But I wanted to make sure that people saw this because there's a group that has to leave. So what I've done is I've taken my normal lecture on the health dangers of GMOs and I have inserted a comment or a story from each of these 18 people that helps to helps us all to understand a little bit more about the dangers and also how to reverse them. This is the cover of the survey that I did that's published in the peer-reviewed International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. And in that, it showed that 85% of the people, of the 3,256 people that filled out the survey, 85% of them showed improvements in digestion. The next was improvements in fatigue, then overweight or obesity, then brain fog, anxiety and depression, or other mood disorders, food allergies, memory or concentration, joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, insomnia, skin conditions other than eczema, um, hormonal problems, musculoskeletal skeletal pain, autoimmune disease, eczema, going all the way down. And the improvements were not minor. This is the improvements in the digestive system, according to the survey, where 80% of those that showed any improvement had either a significant improvement, their situation was nearly gone or completely recovered, attributed to the change in diet, non-GMO and organic. It was actually a question about non-GMO, but we asked them, what else did you do when you switched to non-GMO? And many of them increased their organic consumption. Now, we also have, in addition to the reports from humans getting better, we have reports of lab animals that have been force-fed GMOs in Roundup, and they suffer from many of these same disorders or their precursors. We have veterinarians and pet owners and farmers who talk about the changes in their pets or livestock when they switch to non-GMO. And we have disease rates in the United States going up in parallel with the increased use of GMOs in Roundup. We'll see some of the charts. So um, actually 80 people filled out this survey. Actually, I think it's coming up here. So Michelle Perro was one of the people interviewed in our Healing from GMOs and Roundup series. And she's a pediatrician, and she gives firsthand accounts about what happened to children starting in the early 2000s when they were getting several couple of years doses of GMOs, and most of the GMOs are sprayed with Roundup, so they're getting doses of GMOs and Roundup. And she saw the difference, and she started treating, once she realized the link, she started treating people by putting them on organic diets and watching the change, and it was predictable, and it was consistent. Dr. Mike McNeil is an ag agronomist, and he talks about, in a study that he hadn't yet published, where he went to a farm and he had two different nurseries for pigs, 2,000 pigs in each. And in one, they just served the traditional GMO meal. And in the other, they removed all GMOs and made sure there was no glyphosate in the water either. And in the period of time, it's a little over three months that they're raising these pigs, 400 pigs died in the GMO-fed 
containment facility, and one died in the other. The other facility, the non-GMO group, was also ready. They had gained more weight than the other group. And I'll talk about a situation about botulism with Dr. Mike McNeil a little later. Dr. Barbara Royal, Oprah Winfrey's veterinarian, she told us that in most conditions in dogs and cats are handled in four to six weeks by nothing other than putting them on a healthy diet. And 80 people filled out the form. Let me see if we have that here. Nope. 80 people filled out the survey about their pets and many of the same conditions lined up. Humans getting better from the same conditions that the pets were getting better from in roughly the same percentages. And we have a website called petsandgmos.com where you can go there and see a 10 minute film where I believe there's eight veterinarians interviewed about their experience putting pets on non-GMO and organic diets and what happens. And one of those veterinarians, Dr. Jeffrey Broderick, is here in the front row. Thank you, doctor, for being a dedicated, <laughs> for dedicating so much energy to healthy food for pets. And he described, we just did a live Facebook, which you can catch on the Institute for Responsible Technology uh, Facebook page, where he talked about the incredible increase in lifespan of the animals that were, were raised on his non-GMO and organic pet food, a more than doubling the average of a lifespan in the United States. Now, GMOs, the primary GMOs are soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa. All but alfalfa, more than 90% of the crops in the United States are genetically engineered. Fortunately, there's no popcorn that's GMO, and sweet corn can be GMO, but it's a lot less than 90%. Now, all of these six crops are sprayed with Roundup. They're Roundup-ready crops, specifically engineered not to die when sprayed with an herbicide, which would normally kill it. And this is so farmers can weed more easily. Now, in addition, there's corn, cotton, and in South America, so, uh, soybeans that are engineered with a gene from soil bacteria to produce its own toxin called Bt toxin. And Bt toxin kills insects by poking holes in their guts. And the US regulatory agencies and the Canadian regulatory agencies and others that approved Bt crops did so on the false assumption that Bt toxin, which is used in its natural bacterial state, on crops, it does kill insects that way. They said it's only effective on insects and has no impact on humans. To get to that conclusion, they had to ignore many peer-reviewed studies showing that it did damage the walls of the intestines of mice, it did elicit immune responses in humans. In fact, it pokes holes in human cells, the same type of holes it pokes in insects to kill them. So I was being interviewed by Dr. Tom O'Brien, who is a gluten guru. You may know him. In fact, I originally contacted Tom O'Brien many years ago when I was invited to give a uh, press conference with Mark Hyman and others in New York. It was called Beyond Gluten Sensitivity or Beyond Gluten. And my hypothesis, which I hadn't heard from anyone yet, I think I was the first to bring it out, was that GMOs and Roundup predispose the body for gluten sensitivity, creating leaky gut, activating the immune system, causing uh, problems with the microbiome. And he confirmed that when I described what the body went through with GMOs and Roundup, he confirmed that yes, these are preconditions for gluten sensitivity. And he developed a product that digests gluten within 60 minutes before it leaves the stomach. And we were talking about that and I said, in this interview, well, what does it do to Bt toxin? Bt toxin turns out to be very resistant to digestion, which makes it more probable an allergy. Well, his product digests all the top eight allergens within 60 minutes, and I, he said, I don't know, no one's ever done a study on it, let's find out. 
So at the end of the, we never actually published that video because we were waiting for the, the study to happen. And so in the healing from GMOs and Roundup, he announces the results that within 90 minutes, 60% of the BT toxin is broken down. 99% of all the other allergens, the top eight allergens are broken down, but this is how resistant BT toxin is. So it's good that it's broken down, it just means that it's so resistant, it is much more likely to be an actual allergen. So by the way, I asked these practitioners to give specific recommendations, specific products, specific procedures and protocols that we can all do to heal from GMOs and Roundup. See, normally as a, running a nonprofit, I've shied away from naming brand names, etc. And this, it was tough for me in the beginning, but I had to reverse. I said, tell me all about your product and your clinical experience and your research, because people want to know what to do. Now, there's another GMO type that uses double-stranded RNA. And the apples and potatoes that are engineered not to turn brown when they are sliced use this double-stranded RNA. And I remember talking to Dr. Jonathan, I think it's Landsman, in Mexico at a UN conference. And he had been pushed out of the USDA because he wrote an article basically saying we have no way that we can evaluate the safety of products with double-stranded RNA. The reason is that little, little tiny pieces of double-stranded RNA match up to the code in DNA and silence the gene. But it's not just the, its own DNAs or its own cells double-stranded RNA that does the trick. Mice were fed double-stranded RNA and it silenced a gene in the mice. Honeybees were fed double-stranded RNA and within weeks more than 1400 genes changed their levels of expression. Double-stranded RNA has the capacity to reprogram our DNA. And Sayerji, who runs Green Med Info, he had done a deep dive study of double-stranded RNA, as I had. So in our conversation, we talked all about double-stranded RNA and why friends don't let friends eat the Arctic apple or the innate potato. The double-stranded RNA genetically engineered crops. Because weeds have outsmarted Monsanto, they're now resistant to Roundup. Thousands, millions of more pounds, half a billion pounds more Roundup was used on GMOs because of, was used because of the Roundup Ready crops. So there's 15 times the amount of glyphosate being used now compared to before GMOs were introduced. And one of the things that the biotech industry had bragged about, this was Monsanto's Roundup product, they bragged that glyphosate, their chief poison in Roundup, blocks the shikimate pathway to kill plants. And because humans don't have the shikimate pathway, it's not toxic to humans. Don't believe them. It's a, chief call, it's a chief tool for suicide in some Asian countries. Please don't drink Roundup. But they would say it's drinkable. They'd say it's safer than table salt. Well, it turns out the shikimate pathway is used by humans in our gut bacteria. The bacteria use the shikimate pathway to produce the precursors to serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine, which are absolutely critical. And if we don't have enough of these neurotransmitters, there are several diseases, anxiety, depression, etc., that can occur. Dr. Hyla Cass, author of 10 books, was one of the speakers at our conference. And she described the difference between low serotonin depression, anxious and agitated, versus low dopamine depression, lack of motivation. 
But what I, I was really impressed about was how she was able to identify certain behaviors and link them directly to nutrient deficiency. How if you don't have enough serotonin, she said there's a lot of ladies that she treats, they are binging on food at night, eating ice cream, and they can't help themselves, and they feel terribly guilty. It turns out, she said, the binging can come from low serotonin, and so they're, they're trying to get the foods that the, brings the tryptophan through the blood-brain barrier into the brain so that they can get an uptake of tryptophan. And she talked about even specific antisocial behaviors can come down to certain nutrient deficiencies. And GMOs and Roundup sprayed crops are deficient in nutrients. Dr. Mike McNeil talked about in his interview how he went into two different fields next to each other. GMO field, non-GMO field. Walked a certain number of rows, walked a certain number of corn down, plucked the corn, had them analyzed. I've seen the analysis. The amount of nutrients in the GMO field was ridiculously low. 20 times lower, 30 times lower, 40 times lower, and it had 200 parts per billion in formaldehyde, which is a breakdown product of Roundup. Dr. Zach Bush has amazing information in two interviews I, I did with him, and he talked about the, how Roundup creates gaps between the cells and the humans, which can create leaky gut, and how it can block the intercellular communication but he also told me something that I had never heard. He said the shikimate pathway not only produces the aromatic amino acids that produce the serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin, but it produces the body's own medicine chest to combat pain, inflammation, etc. And so we actually can have lots of diseases just from this one action by glyphosate, blocking the shikimate pathway by gut bacteria. So what we did is we looked at one mode of action of Roundup, and we saw that it can affect mood and behavior, it can affect pain, it can affect inflammation, just from the shikimate pathway. But it turns out it also depletes minerals. How many people know why, what the first patent was for glyphosate? Raise your hand. The first patent for glyphosate was to clean boilers and pipes. Because it's a chelator, it grabs onto all the minerals. So it would strip the mineral buildup in the pipes. And when they spread the residue on the ground, it killed all the plants. Now it turns out this mineral deficiency is really serious. First of all, all the crops that are sprayed with Roundup, the Roundup Ready crops, ridiculously low minerals. And who eats the mineral, the mineral deficient crops? In addition to humans, all the livestock. So there is an epidemic, according to Art Dunham a, and others, other veterinarians that have actually tested the minerals and the organs of livestock. They're eating Roundup Ready crops as their primary source of food. In addition, they get tons of residues of glyphosate. And once it enters their bodies, what does it do? It grabs onto minerals. It hugs them tightly and doesn't let go. It cannot be used by the body. And the reason why minerals are important is that they're the key to the ignition in all of these functions in our body. There's all these metabolic pathways. And these metabolic pathways have a cofactor. And all the, all the workers are sitting around with their hard hats and they've got their lunch pails and they're just waiting as if they're on strike. Because the mineral needs to enter the scene for them to go to work. And by blocking these trace minerals that are in small quantities in the body, by making them scarce, it shuts down all of these workers in the body. Dr. Lee Cowden was interviewed and he teaches protocols to doctors on Lyme disease, on cancer, etc. He's a doctor's doctor. And he said that he has been testing minerals in the human population in the United States for years. And since GMOs were introduced, 
the amount of minerals is less and less and less, and the needed minerals is more and more and more. So one of the ways to heal from GMOs and Roundup, in addition to providing the missing pieces from the Shikame pathway, is to provide the missing minerals. Because we're getting mineral deficient when we eat products that have been sprayed with Roundup. Roundup also damages the microvilli and suppresses digestive enzymes. I interviewed David Sandoval and Andre Naj, and they formulated a product which is designed into, was actually specifically designed about glyphosate. One, it repairs the microvilli, and two, it is designed to pull the glyphosate out of the tissues and to bring it out of the body. And their research, which they shared, shows a 74% reduction of glyphosate in the urine without changing the diet. And at the same time, a 75% reduction in, CR, in C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Now, glyphosate is toxic to the mitochondria. The mitochondria are involved with aging, energy, cancer, and health all together. I've been, I actually presented at a conference. It was a two-day conference just on the mitochondria. There's a whole group of functional medical doctors and others that realize that the mitochondria is, is a major driver. 10% of our body weight, I'm told, is mitochondria. Some cells have 5,000 mitochondria in them. I think the heart cell that needs all that energy. And glyphosate and Roundup are toxic. One of the speakers described how they took tissues from an old person and a young person and analyzed it, and the only difference they found was in the old person, most of the mitochondria were damaged. So there's a mitochondrial theory of aging, and there's also a mitochondrial theory of cancer. Joe Mercola said the mitochondria in the interview is key to long life and overall health, and it produces free radicals and energy and he described how we can have flexible diets. He talked about temporary keto diets and intermittent fasting, and he gave all sorts of very advanced um, biochemical pathways and how to supplement for those pathways to act more effectively so that we can basically give health to the mitochondria. Glyphosate also promotes birth defects. It is an endocrine disruptor, so it can mess up the hormones. It disrupts a key metabolic pathway that's responsible for, largely, for detoxing the liver. Now, a lot of the chemicals in the environment get detoxed by our liver. If we shut down that process, it means it amplifies all of the other toxins. So in that sense, glyphosate could be the mother of toxicity because it enhances the toxicity of others. Glyphosate was declared by the World Health Organization's Institute for Aid, or International Agency for Research on Cancer as a probable human carcinogen. They said it's probably carcinogenic to humans, but there's not enough studies. It's definitely carcinogenic to animals. It causes mutations in DNA, which can lead to cancer. And, as, and where it is applied, there are higher rates of cancer. Where I live now in California, glyphosate was declared a carcinogen by the government agency. There are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence now that it causes cancer. In fact, on our website at responsibletechnology.org, I interview Brent Wisner, who is the brilliant articulate, energetic, powerful thinking attorney who won the case against Monsanto in the Bay Area in the summer. And the jury awarded Lee Johnson, who had terminal cancer after spraying Monsanto's Roundup, awarded him $289 million of money from Monsanto, now Bayer. Bayer's stock price dropped 20 to 30 percent by 20 to 30 billion dollars because there's 9,700 more plaintiffs waiting in the wings now to sue. 
The judge dropped the award to 78 million, but if you multiply that by 9,700, you still get a very large number. Now, it's interesting that Dr. Charles Benbrook last week released a study showing that this organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, relied a lot on peer-reviewed published studies, most of which showed that glyphosate and Roundup damaged the DNA, which could lead to cancer. But the EPA looked at primarily company unpublished research that said it was safe. Imagine that. On the interviews, which I just added last week, I interview Brent Wisner about Dr. Parry. You see, Monsanto's executives were concerned because there was mounting evidence in the literature that glyphosate was causing mutations or genotoxicity in human DNA or DNA in general. And so they brought in arguably the world's leading expert, Dr. Parry, to figure out how they can get out of this. And they were hoping he would review some studies, say it's not genotoxic, and then they could settle the issue. So Dr. Perry looked at just the four studies that they were given, that he was given by his Monsanto people, and said, yeah, it appears that it's probably genotoxic and could lead to cancer. So they got very nervous about it, and they sent him all the data, hoping he'd reverse his mind. He said, no, based on this, it's definitely causing cancer. Definitely, it definitely is genotoxic. And to list, to, I actually had a chance to read some of the memos and emails and texts passed back and forth by Monsanto people, where one person wrote, has Dr. Parry ever done research for industry before? And, and another person saying, we could spend a lot of money trying to bring him around, but maybe we should just bring someone else in who we know will come around, who know, we know is on our side. So he wrote a report, Perry wrote a report, it was buried. They said, thank you very much. He never worked for Monsanto again. And Monsanto was legally required to turn over that report to the EPA. Oops, it was misplaced. They never did. Instead, and this, was, this came out in the memos that were made public because of this lawsuit, they ghost wrote a review paper which concluded just the opposite. Their review paper, which was cited by the EPA and the European authorities, the one that Monsanto wrote but didn't admit to writing, claims that there's no genotoxicity. And on that basis, that was one of the bases why these regulatory agencies gave Roundup and glyphosate flying colors. No problem. Now, Carrie Gillum, who, will be, who spoke here already and is speaking here tonight on a panel, I'll be joining her with Vanda Nashiva and Caitlin Shetterly. She has been following these Monsanto papers. And my interview with her is exactly how Monsanto covered up the damages. And she wrote an excellent book, and I, she can, I think it's for sale here. Um, and it's, I love catching the industry red-handed. I love when we find clear evidence, like the letter that was uncovered by Marion Copley to Jess Rowland. Jess had a master's degree in science, and, and Marion had a PhD, and she said to him, you're completely unqualified to determine whether glyphosate causes cancer. Here's 14 reasons why it causes cancer. Please do something finally, please finally do something for public good and not to increase your bonuses or help the companies that are submitting the products. Please determine that glyphosate causes cancer. And this other woman that you're working with, if anyone in the, in the agency is taking bribes, it's her. This was a powerful letter. Marion Copley was a 30-year senior toxicologist at the EPA but she had, to, she had to leave because she had cancer. And at the end she says, I have cancer, and I wanted to make sure I did the right thing before I go to my grave. Pleading with Jess Rowland. 
Jess Rowland's name came up in Monsanto papers. He was their lapdog. He's the one that said, if I can stop this other agency from doing a test of glyphosate in cancer, I deserve a medal. He was telling that to his, round, his, his Monsanto handlers. They said how he was a valuable asset at the EPA. How valuable? He was in charge of the committee in the EPA that determined that glyphosate did not cause cancer. He was in charge of the committee that we now know cherry-picked the data, ignoring 80 or so published, peer-reviewed studies, and instead moving to the studies produced by companies like Monsanto. And we just heard the kind of studies, unquote, that they produce. They came up with a tentative or a preliminary result, which wasn't supposed to be published. Magically, it appeared on the website. It was immediately copied by Monsanto. It was sent to different regulatory agencies. It was sent to the media, and then it was taken down. And a few days later, Jess Rowland left the agency. And Monsanto used that preliminary determination to fight their fight around the world. Probably put up by their lapdog. I don't know. Glyphosate promotes leaky gut. How many people have heard of leaky gut? How many people have heard of autoimmune disease? How many people know that they're linked? Almost everyone that raised their hand. Here's my quick definition of how. Food is normally broken down into teensy-weensy pieces. That's a technical term. In the gut, it gets absorbed through the walls of the cell, one cell thick walls of the intestine into the bloodstream. It becomes our nutrition. Glyphosate, if you put it in a petri dish with human cells, they'll separate. The tight junctions separate. Bt toxin in a petri dish pokes holes inside the cells. Those are two types of leaky gut. Inside the cell, between the cell. If you have holes in the gut, then you have undigested proteins. Not the teensy-weensy ones, the big, huge ones and they lumber into the, into the bloodstream, and the immune system treats it as a, an invader. And the immune system takes out the iPhone, they're a very modern immune system, they take a picture, okay, smile everyone, we're now the immune system, okay? Here we go, got you on the picture, okay, I actually took your picture. Um, and they post it on Facebook, I won't do that now. And they send it to the rest of the immune system and say, Anything that looks like this is an enemy, attack it. But they have an old iPhone. It's pixelated, it's hard to read. So they attack anything that looks like that protein. The thyroid, the pancreas, the microvilli. That's autoimmune disease. It's the immune system attacking itself because it thinks it's attacking an invader because of two things, leaky gut and old iPhones. So that's how autoimmune disease works. The body attacks itself. And that's one of the things that are linked to leaky gut. Also cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, heart disease, food sensitivities, inflammation of all types. And did I say autism? Okay. In terms of leaky gut, we have evidence from Zach Bush that when you put glyphosate in the... Two, in the uh, Petri dish, but you put his uh, product in there first, it doesn't separate. Or once it separates and you add his product, it then recombines. So these are ways to heal from GMOs and Roundup based on real evidence as well as clinical evidence. Now glyphosate is an antibiotic. That's its second patent. And we know that it kills beneficial bacteria the kind of stuff we like in yogurt that we pay for, the lactobacillus, the bifidobacteria. It doesn't kill the botulism, the E. coli, the salmonella. I realize, how many people are like aware that the microbiome is like cutting edge in medicine right now? So it's cutting edge in medicine right now. Now you're aware. Um, it's amazing how important the gut bacteria is. And here's an example of one thing that's happening to cows probably across this country in Europe. There is bacteria inside the gut of a cow which suppress the Clostridium botulinum um, bacteria. 
And Clostridium botulinum produces bot toxin, one of the most toxic substances known to man. But glyphosate easily kills this bacteria. So now we have in the gut of animals an explosion of Clostridium botulinum and an explosion of botulism toxin. And so chronic botulism turns out to be an epidemic proportions. And we think it's because of the Roundup Ready crops that are being fed to the animals. Now, I mentioned earlier that Mike McNeil shared a story about botulism, and it's quite emotional. And I will say it, and I might tear up, and so what? It's exciting. He was giving a talk, and was invited. He had a couple of days, or a day after the, his talk, he was able to leave late, so he, he was visiting with someone who was in the audience and said, I'd like to show you my dairy. He was very proud of his dairy, so Mike McNeil, an agronomist, went to see his cows. And he was observing, and he was looking around here and looking around, and at the end, the, the farmer said, so what do you think? And he said, very fine-looking cows. Excellent. But then he had to be really gentle. And he said, you know, I noticed that you had a couple of cows that were not eating well. Uh, I'm going to make a little prediction that in a few days, I think they were going to eat a lot, and then they were going to, the next day, they were going to be dead. Maybe with foamy mouths. I forget the details. It was, it was several months ago that I interviewed him. But he was, when he said that, the farmer got white and said, oh my God, that just happened. What is it? And he said, these cows are suffering with chronic botulism. They have all the signs. And it's because of the Roundup. Because it's, but I don't use Roundup. He says, I noticed that there was some dried distiller grains that you used to supplement your feed that did not have non-GMO written on it and did not have organic written on it. And they're loaded with Roundup. So your cows probably got botulism toxin and are dying, some of them, because of it. And he said, and don't drink that milk. And then the guy froze and said, what could happen? My grandchild is in the hospital. Two months old. They don't know why. It was fed the milk. Mike said, go to the hospital right now. Ask them to test for botulism poisoning. Do it. Don't stand here. Go right now. Saved his life. It was botox. It was a very dramatic story, and there's a lot of them in this, in this uh, series. Now, the microbiome is amazing. It's like another organ working on our, on our behalf. Kieran Krishnan does research into the microbiome, and he has a product that he's identified the superhero keystone strains that help with biodiversity, that help with inflammation. And he says that right now there's evidence that nearly all of the major diseases that we face, all of them, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, obesity, diabetes, start with dis destructed or destroyed uh, balance in the microbiome. And if you can actually keep the balance in the microbiome, you're doing amazing work to protect yourself from a long list of diseases. And he's doing research on glyphosate, clinical research, he's doing research in fake guts, he's doing all sorts of actual hands-on research, not just looking it up and saying, well, this strain helps here, so we'll package it and sell it. He's seeing that if they work that way, even in combination with other strains. How many people have heard of Dr. Dietrich Klinghart? He's like, a, in, the, in the progressive health field, he's like a demigod. He's the one that basically popularized the danger of Lyme disease. He popularized the danger of mercury poisoning. And I saw him speak in an environmental health symposium, and he said, the next big toxin we need to focus on is glyphosate. And he told me he had a whole glyphosate protocol for detoxing and, and repairing, and that's what was one of the major inspirations for me to do this series. And he told me something that I had never heard from anyone else. He said, 
his sickest patients, including those with autism, when you test their urine, they have no glyphosate in the urine. He starts the detox protocol, and then the amount of glyphosate starts to show up and increase in the urine. It's possible that these very sick individuals are unable to detox glyphosate without assistance. Because normally we think that if we have high levels of glyphosate, then we're at greater risk, higher levels in our urine. It's interesting that uh, we're going to hear about the amount of glyphosate in the urine of dogs in a few minutes and what that might be related to. Now, one of the best ways to get a healthy microbiome is from fermented vegetables. How many people have fermented their own vegetables? So this woman, Karen Diggs, did a crowdsourcing campaign for an invention that she called CrowdSource, where it was a top that you can screw on to mason jars that makes creating fermented vegetables easier than cooking food. And she described, and she's also a chef, so she actually has a, a um, cookbook and sells even spice combinations so that it's not just always cabbage turned into sauerkraut, but a whole variety of different healthy, uh, delicious fermented vegetables. And she was also interviewed. Now, another problem of Roundup is that it's toxic to the liver. In fact, they found that in this study that the amount of Roundup in the water supply that caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was so small, the EPA allows in our water supply on a per body weight per day basis, 437,500 times more. In other words, these rats had high parts per trillion glyphosate and they developed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 25% of Americans have that. It leads to other more serious diseases like cancer, cirrhosis, etc. These are pictures of rat livers, of rats that were fed GMO Roundup Ready soy on the right and non-GMO soy on the left. Julie Daniluk, who is an expert in nutrition, she talked about how to use food as detoxing agents, and specifically how specific foods can heal, help the two phases of liver detoxification. Now this is a picture of testicles of rats. On the left, they were fed non-GMO soy. On the right, they were fed GMO soy. So the GMO soy changed the testicles of livers from pink to blue. And I always like to take a long, slow drink of water at this point. You see, the, the, the gender that's most sensitive to food issues are women. So I like to leave this up a little longer so that the guys can catch up. <laughs> Mice fed GM soy had damage to their testicles, including damaged young sperm cells. Rats fed GM soy, the females had changes in the uterus, ovaries, and hormone balance. I spoke at the European Parliament one year, many years ago, and there were some several scientists speaking at the same time, including Dr. Irina Ermakova, a senior researcher at the Russian Academy of Sciences. She gave me these slides, so these are Russian-speaking rats. <clears throat> and they volunteered for an experiment with GM soy. And these female rats were fed GM soy starting two weeks before they got pregnant and continued to eat the GM soy. And more than half of their babies died within three weeks compared to a 10% death rate among rats that were fed non-GM soy. The rats were also smaller and could not reproduce. Another Russian Academy of Sciences scientist did experiments with hamsters, fed for two years, over a third generation. They were un they, most were infertile. They suffered slower growth, a four to five fold increase in, in, in uh, infant mortality, and many had a, de a defect of hair growing in their mouths. 
There was a study done by Dr. Seralini. How many people have seen this slide before? <clears throat> it's quite famous. Dr. Seralini is a toxicologist from France. And he was the person who was advising the French government as a member of two committees and even the European Union on GMO submissions. And he realized that although Monsanto and their minions claimed that the rats had no damage as a result of being exposed to their corn, for example, he was seeing signs of toxicity that were being ignored and was able to publish a study showing that three of Monsanto corn varieties were causing signs of toxicity. So he took the corn variety that had the highest level of toxicity or the highest level of statistically significant differences, Roundup Ready corn, and secretly did a study for two years, secretly because Monsanto always tries to disrupt things. So he secretly did a study for two years and do it to, to see if the Roundup Ready corn had a problem. No one had done a study like that. There were no published protocols. So we followed, at the very least, the protocols that Monsanto used to get their products approved. The same number in the experimental group, the same number of controls, the same rats. And after two years, well, first of all, Monsanto does their research for only 90 days. He was doing it for two years. In the next month, after 90 days, one of the, one of the rats started to develop tumors. And by the end of two years, many had multiple massive tumors. When they hit 25% of body weight, they had to be killed as part of the laboratory policy. So you can see the huge tumors in these rats. They also died prematurely. They also had damaged organs, liver, kidneys, pituitary. and In some cases, hormonal imbalance. Now, he wanted to find out whether it was the Roundup or the, or the corn or the combination that caused the problem. So one of the experimental groups just ate Roundup Ready corn that was never sprayed with Roundup. Another group was fed the Roundup Ready corn that had been sprayed. And a third group <coughs> was fed the Roundup without the corn. These are the three groups. All three groups. Multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. This means, <clears throat> this means that alone and in combination, it's the process of genetic engineering, it's the roundup, and, the, and together cause these problems. Now this was the most in-depth research study to date on GMO health. And it showed massive damage. This alone should have signaled an alarm around the world. But the biotech industry has a program called Let Nothing Go. They have people in high places around the world. They have people who have front groups that basically get paid by Monsanto to pretend that they're independent. They have people in, in editorial positions. And when this came out, within 24 hours, everyone was sent a bunch of talking points. And they all said the same thing. They used the wrong rats. Well, those are the same rats that Monsanto used. They had the, their control group was too small. It was the same size that Monsanto used. But they kept saying it louder and louder. And then at a certain point, the, the talking points shifted, as they always do, to say there's a consensus. Who's the consensus among? Those that are reading the talking points. So this was circulated to governments and media so this information was suppressed. Now, it also turns out that the editor of this paper was being pressured and attacked by Monsanto's minions. And then Monsanto hired the editor and paid him $400 an hour for some project. And then soon after, the editor retracted this paper and said in his letter, it's retracted because of these reasons. Now, there are published manuals as to why papers need to be retracted, and his reasons are never used. For example, inconclusive. And someone analyzed the other 
papers published in his journal, and one third of them would have to be removed according to that criteria. So then he scrambled and said, oh, actually, it's because it wasn't a proper cancer study. You need more rats for a cancer study. It's true. If it were a cancer study, you'd need more rats. But nowhere in the write-up of the study did they use the word cancer. It was a toxicological study, and they found tumors, much to their surprise. So the guy was obviously scrambling for some justification. Hundreds of scientists wrote, condemning this action, and the guy was kicked out of the journal. Another journal immediately published it, did another peer review. It actually got past three peer reviews. Now, one of the arguments used by the biotech industry was that the Sprague Dolly rats that are pictured here get tumors anyway. That's what they're used for, cancer studies. And they said, see, in our cancer studies, about 80% of the rats get cancer. Your experimental group had 80 or 90%, but your controls only had maybe 10%. So we're not going to even pay attention to your controls done in a well-controlled experiment because they were supposed to have gotten cancer. We don't know why they didn't get cancer. They were supposed to have gotten cancer. So we're going to compare your experimental group to our controls over here, which is not scientific. So, Seralini's team did something brilliant. They took rat chow from around the world and tested it. This is the rat chow they use on rat and mice ex and on rat experiments around the world for the controls. And the rat chow was filled with GMOs and Roundup. And if the control groups in these rat experiments all around the world are getting cancer at 80%, and his experimental group that was fed GMOs and Roundup got 80%, no wonder. He used organic, non-sprayed control material for his control group. And only 10% or so got cancer. So all of the research done on GMOs by the biotech industry compares animals that have been fed GMOs and probably Roundup to other animals that have been fed GMOs and Roundup. And still they find problems because the percentage is high. And what do they do with those problems? They try to explain them away. Now, I interviewed Dr. Seralini, who had been attacked by scientists for years. He actually won a libel case against them and extracted his penalty. He asked the courts to, to rule in his favor, and they did. He said, I want one euro. So he got paid one euro. There was also a forgery case against one of his detractors. Someone had apparently or allegedly signed someone else's signature to a letter to condemn Seralini. It turns out he was the group that found that glyphosate alone is just one of many, many toxins in Roundup. But Roundup can be 125 times more toxic. But the EPA only requires Monsanto to submit tests on glyphosate alone. And not only glyphosate alone, but a version of glyphosate that's not even used in their formulation. They use glyphosate salts, which are much more toxic, but they have to do studies on glyphosate technical. So they use the wrong substance to test. They use it in isolation, which it's never applied in isolation. Its toxicity is enhanced by the formulation. And yet, this is what our regulatory agencies are doing. Seralini not only has been the lead tester of GMOs and Roundup, but he actually tested a product, several products of herbs, aromatic herbs, for detoxification, and found, for example, one product that helped the body detoxify, the body of rats detoxify the glyphosate. And he said, this tells us we can use aromatic herbs, just like they suggested in indigenous people, take these aromatic herbs and put them on warm food at the end of cooking, and then eat it with the food, and it'll detoxify. But he found that if you put six 
herbs, then the cells will detoxify the aromatic herbs instead of the glyphosate. But if you put three, then it was actually successful. So not to overload the system with too many herbs. Josh Axe talked about how Roundup and GMOs affect people differently, talking about the body types, the Ayurvedic body types and the Chinese body types, and how the gut and the liver are the starting points for the treatment of people exposed to GMOs and Roundup. So now I'm going to go through some of the charts which show a correlation between the use of glyphosate-based herbicides on GMO soy and corn, or the acreage of GMO soy and corn, or both, with specific diseases. Now, it's important to note that these are correlations. Just because they move together does not mean that Roundup causes the disease. This is inflammatory bowel disease correlated with glyphosate-sprayed herbicides on GMO soy and corn. You can see a very tight control. The, the, the uh, number is 0.9378. If it were a perfect line, exactly it would be a 1. So it was a pretty close correlation. But on this basis alone, we can never say that A causes B. But when you understand that when people stop exposing themselves to glyphosate and GMOs, and 85% of those who reported to us get better from digestive conditions like inflammatory bowel disease. And pig farmers say that when they take their animals off of the Roundup Ready soy, they, have, they get rid of the diarrhea and their digestive problems. Same with the intractable diarrhea of pets, as described to me by veterinarians. And when you have plausible causative pathways about how glyphosate can cause gaps in the walls of the intestines and change the gut bacteria and damage the internal microvilli, etc., etc. When you have all of these together, then this data, these data are quite supportive and important as part of the bigger picture. Having said that, I'm now going to share with you many slides, many diseases. And I want you to just look at these at these, um, whoops, trying to hit the, uh, here we go. Just, I can't get the, uh, here we are. Just look at this slope here. Just look at the slope to see the correlation. I'll read the name of the disease. So you can focus on that so we can go through these quickly. This is inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease. This is deaths due to intestinal infection. Peritonitis, an inflammatory disease of the digestive tract. This is liver and bile duct cancer. Kidney and pelvic cancer. Urinary and bladder cancer. Thyroid cancer. Deaths, to, deaths due to acute myeloid leukemia. Kidney failure and death. Kidney injury. Hepatitis C. Autism in six-year-olds. This is a 0.9972 correlation. And this is comparing Glyphosate, uh, glyphosate as applied over four years total. So it showed an accumulation of glyphosate exposure to our food supply, which made the correlation even tighter. Diabetes. I can't read that. What does it say? Stroke. Deaths due to stroke. Dementia. Senile dementia deaths. Alzheimer deaths. Deaths from Parkinson's disease. Deaths due to obesity. Deaths due to high blood pressure. Anemia. 
insomnia, sleep disorders, celiac disease, birth defects, congenital birth defects, disorders, deaths due to disorders of lipoprotein metabolism, anxiety, suicide by overdose, schizophrenia, ADHD. So these diseases are very serious. I believe that they are exacerbated and possibly created for some individuals from GMOs and Roundup. And I base that on some of the evidence we've shared today. And we could spend a week meeting each day and looking at one disease and say, okay, what could possibly cause insomnia or sleep disorders from GMOs and Roundup? Well, earlier in the conversation, we talked about the shikimate pathway producing serotonin. Serotonin leads to melatonin. Melatonin governs our circadian rhythms and sleep. Serotonin is also produced by cells along the gut wall by interacting with the microbiome, with the gut bacteria. If we damage the gut bacteria, they may not function well to produce the serotonin. So those are some examples of how we can break it down to what we've already seen. And there's some people who are taking the biochemistry way further and finding absolutely elegant pathways that could explain these diseases. The reason why these charts were published in peer-reviewed journals was because these group of scientists believe that these particular diseases would be predicted from GMOs and Roundup. And that's why they did the study, and that's what they found. So in that context, these are quite important. And now the bad news. Roundup is sprayed on oats, wheat, barley, rye, rice, potato fields, sweet potato fields, lentils, mung beans, citrus orchards, grape vineyards, kiwi orchards. It is sprayed throughout our food supply. It is found in its highest concentration, not in GMOs, but in oats. It is sprayed before harvest to dry down the cereals, to force quick ripening to clean the weeds out for next year, all sometimes three to five days before harvest. Heavy dose. In oats, it gets absorbed right into the oats. It gets absorbed into the wheat and spread out into the wheat kernel. So you can buy a non-GMO loaf of bread, but be eating glyphosate residues. So the need now is not to simply be non-GMO. The need is to become organic, which doesn't allow either GMOs or Roundup or other chemical toxins. Larry Bolin was interviewed on healing from GMOs and Roundup, and he runs a laboratory in Iowa that tests for glyphosate in foods. And he actually puts on the screen some of his test results, and oats is at the top. And he said, I've created a mnemonic called OWL, O-W-L. Oats, wheat, lentils. Those were the highest he's tested. He will never eat those unless they're organic. We will be publishing soon a compilation of all of the tests done on foods to see where the glyphosate levels are. And all the foods have not been tested. You see, the, the government tests the levels of other herbicides on all the foods, but not on Roundup, because of their, they have friends in high places in Monsanto. Now, Larry Bolin tested dog urine, and it was at the time 50 times, and then with additional samples, it went down to 40 times the amount of glyphosate in human urine. Now, it turns out that dogs have the highest rate of cancer of any mammal. I was told as high as one out of every 1.6 dogs. And they have 40 times the amount 
of glyphosate in their urine. And a peer-reviewed published study was published just, I think, last month. A second group did glyphosate testing in urine, found the same thing. We tested dog food and cat food and found levels of glyphosate. And if you go to petsandgmos.com, you can get a list of the pet food that has high levels of glyphosate and GMOs and how to buy products that are without the GMOs and Roundup. Petsandgmos.com. We think that the high rate of cancer, which was, is a new phenomenon. If you go on that site, there's a two minute video and a 10 minute video with lots of veterinarians talking about this. And they say, we used to not have to deal with cancer in dogs or allergies. And now we deal with it all the time. And what's been changing? Dr. Michael Fox, who's the animal doctor, syndicated columnist with 25 to 30 million readers, 40 books to his credit. He was, he gets, he's in a unique position because he gets letters from people all over the country all the time. GMOs were introduced into the human food supply. They became introduced into the pet food supply at the same time. All of a sudden, he gets all these letters from pet parents saying, my dog or cat is now suffering from digestive problems and itching and allergies and intractable diarrhea. He said, get them off of GMOs. He has a file draw filled with people that told him it worked. Barbara Royal was, inter was interviewed, I mentioned her. In a subsequent interview I did with her, she said that 50 to 70% of the pets put on a different diet when they see her with nothing else done, no supplement, no pill, no shot, just changing the diet, 50 to 70% come back with managed or eliminated symptoms. So that gives you an idea of the level of impact we're seeing. So what I've just done is I've taken you on a tour of GMO dangers and I stepped a little bit above my pay grade, but not really because I was quoting others and telling the stories that they had about that extra question, what can we do besides avoiding GMOs and Roundup? And many of them said this over and over again because they give suggestions for products that they formulated, that they prescribed, that they've used in clinical settings. And they said, if you don't change your diet, these other things may not work or will not work. It's like, without the right food, this is a, an ancient saying I think in Ayurveda, without the right food, the medicine won't work. With the right food, the medicine's not needed. So, if you decide to get this series, and we have a discount of more than 50% for this group, you're gonna see recommendations for over 50 different products or foods, sauna detox opportunities, when to exercise in relationship to the sauna. You'll have you know, products that have been shown to decrease glyphosate, close gaps, you know, repopulate the microbiome. Please don't get seduced by thinking it's in the pill and that you can continue to eat GMOs and Roundup and just take the pill and be fine. So if you decide to get this series, you may want to change your diet immediately and see what happens so that if you get these other things, you can tell the difference as to what's diet related and what's substance or, or supplement related. But if you're interested, I'll, I'll mention it for those that you go to healingfromgmos.com, and if you go into the checkout process, just before you check out, it says promo code. You can put truth as your code for the real truth about health, and it drops more than 50%. And for people in the room, I have some order forms you can fill out if you want. I'll meet you in the back. And if you want to, if you can't take a picture of this or write it down, you can text the word truth to 38470, and you'll get back immediately the website and the promo code so that you won't forget. So it's, it's, you text TRUTH 
to the phone number 38470. 38470. So it's interesting that this is a departure for me talking about healing from GMOs. It's a departure for me selling a, a, an online course. But what's not a departure for me is helping protect people's lives. I've been told over and over again by parents, sometimes breaking down into tears, that I saved their lives or their kids' lives. I was at MIT speaking there. I asked the audience, as I usually do, tell me what you noticed got better when you switched to a non-GMO or organic diet. And a woman stood up and said, my six and a half year old was violent and out of control. They wanted to kick him out of school. I saw your movie, Genetic Roulette. I changed his diet. All the problems went away. I said, how long did it take? She said, one week. And then she paused and said, within a month, I had a new son. I was at a conference in California, and someone who was volunteering at the table was a grandmother. And her grandson was always acting out, and she said there were phone calls nearly every day from the school to the parents. And he also had trouble breathing. She saw the film Genetic Roulette and said to her son, talk about being a salesperson. She said, if there's anything you do in your life because I ask you to, watch this film. He watched it. He changed his son's diet, and he no longer had trouble breathing, and he no longer had calls from school, except in the days after he had eaten at the other grandmother's house. So the reaction was quick. I have seen these changes. In fact, these were the kind of things that propelled me to do the film with Amy Hart called Secret Ingredients, which is better than Genetic Roulette, it's more engaging because it introduces, for example, Kathleen DiChiara, whose family had 21 chronic conditions between the five of them. And she started to experiment and studied food, and she started to experiment on the family and taking gluten out and preservatives and soy and different things and testing to see what was happening on her family and herself. And after some years, they were still managing 21 conditions, but they were better. And then she learned about GMOs and Roundup, switched to organic, and immediately, things that have been plaguing them for years went away. And within just six months, it was all gone. They were no longer managing these symptoms. And the same day I met that I met Kathleen, I met the woman that is a chiropractor who has a, had, a, as far as I know, still a 100% cure rate on infertility. 92 out of 92 couples. And many of these had been to fertility clinics and been told there's something wrong and they will never have children. And others, they couldn't find anything wrong. And the main thing she did, in addition to chiropractic, Put them on an organic diet. So I recommend watching the film Secret Ingredients as our number one recommendation because we need to finish the tipping point. The tipping point is underway against GMOs. We need to get more and more people to say no so that the food companies absolutely do not try to hold on to any remaining GMOs. And we need to create an organic tidal wave so that Anyone who has a digestive disorder, they know it's in the wind. They have to eat organic. Anyone that has an infertility issue, they have to eat organic. Anyone that's fatigued, brain fog, overweight, eat organic. We need to create those viral ideas. So I'm asking you, when we have a few secret ingredients, but if you go to secretingredientsmovie.com, you can see it online, you can click over to iTunes or Google Play or Amazon. Please share it with a thousand of your closest personal friends. We'll be having a community showing license program with a toolkit 
set up on our website soon. We have been incredibly successful at educating people about the health dangers of GMOs. When I started 23 years ago, the answer was, what's a GMO? Now surveys show that 46% of Americans say they're trying to avoid GMOs. 46%. We don't need half that. We don't need a third of that to change the world. Because as soon as the food companies realize that their competitor on the same shelf saying non-GMO is stealing their customers, they will scramble as they are now to eliminate GMOs so that they can put non-GMO on their product. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to participate in this global transformation. And I'll give you one more excuse. You notice I haven't talked about the environment. That's because I had an image a long time ago of a Greenpeace activist clearing away GMO field trials in Europe secretly and then celebrating in the pub and eating genetically engineered corn chips. It's easy to get people to hate Monsanto, now bear. It's easy to talk about the outrage. But to get people to change their diet requires a behavior change messaging linked to our health. But the environmental impact is worse. If you introduce a GMO into the environment, the genes become a permanent feature of the gene pool. It gets passed on generation after generation. The only thing that lasts longer than a contaminated gene pool is extinction. Right now, the biotech industry has the goal of genetically engineering everything. All the insects, livestock, trees, fish, flowers, algae, bacteria. And they have new tools. CRISPR-Cas9, a gene editing tool. Cheap, easy, dangerous. Because they have told everyone, oh, it's so precise and so predictable. We should just call it breeding. It's not really a GMO. Look the other way. If that happens, and we cannot identify a gene-edited food, there is a gold rush into the genome right now. All these groups are trying to identify gene function, make a change, patent it, and get their crops or products out in the market to make money before the patent expires. If we don't act, we will be giving something new to the next generation. They will have replaced nature. Eliminated the billions of years of evolution products and replaced it with designer organisms designed by companies like Bayer and DuPont, designed for greater profit and control. The number one most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. So there's a poet that wrote a poem about being woken up in the middle of the night by his great-great-grandson, asking, what did you do when you found out? I submit to you that going to Washington to try and change this administration's ideas about GMOs or the Obama administration or the Bush administration or any of the administrations since Reagan is impossible because it's locked down already. So how did we get the tipping point? Individuals. Passionate individuals who care about health. I'm guessing that's you. I'm guessing that because you're here in this room or watching this online, you are a passionate individual about health. And we are in charge. The biggest epidemic around this whole topic is the thought that it's someone else's responsibility and I'm sure they're doing a good job. 
or even if they're not, it's not my responsibility. That's the epidemic that is the basis of GMOs around the world. I go to other countries. I've been to 45 countries. I'll speak to a regulator. We don't have to regulate GMOs because your FDA says it's safe. You go to the FDA. We don't have to regulate it because Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, later their vice president, was in charge of GMO policy, and he allows the businesses to regulate, to decide whether GMOs are safe. You look at their research, it's all rigged. No one is in charge. No one is taking responsibility. So this is my call to action. Please do something about this. This is not just your health and your family's health. And it is huge. You've seen those diseases there. If GMOs and Roundup contributed to 10% of the growth of those diseases, it's an epidemic proportions. Please do something. And my recommendation, and the reason why I spent years creating it with Amy Hart, my recommendation is it's all in the movie, Secret Ingredients. More powerful than this lecture. More, it is, we do pre and post test studies on audiences that see it, and everyone's like, okay, I want to switch. So as I finish now, I want to ask you to rate yourself from 1 to 100. What percentage do you want your, and you plan on your diet being organic going forward? How many people want low percentage, 1 to 20? Raise your hand. 20 to 40. No one has raised their hand yet, by the way. 40 to 60. Couple, 60 to 80. A few more, 80 to 100. And they have it. Congratulations. Give yourself a hand. And lastly, how active do you plan to be getting this information out? How important is it to you? How many people are low motivation for that? Zero to 20, raise your hand. No one, 20 to 40. 40 to 60, a few. 60 to 80, and 80 to 100. Most of you, another hand. So, sign up for responsibletechnology.org. We'll give you a lot of information to share. But the movie, secretingredientsmovie.com, there's a few here. That would be the tool that I think will work the most efficiently. Because that's why, and I believe it, because that's why I created it. Thank you all very much. Safe eating. <laughs>